So today's question is, uh, what is underlying all of big history? And the answer is very simple. It is empirical evidence and scholarly interpretations. And, and what is empirical evidence? That is basically everything that we can observe with our eyes, with our ears, with our nose, with our fingers, everything. And in modern times, we use, of course, instruments to make many of these observations. But it's the, in the end, it's always humans who do it and humans who also interpret it. We interpret it in very specific ways. Things have to be logical, cannot contradict each other, and we follow other rules that are basic for uh, forming our scholarly interpretations. Now that is the basic combination, the empirical evidence and careful thinking, and that is underlying all of big history. Now I'm going to show you a simple observation that has been fundamental in shaping the image of the universe that we have today. And here you see Esther Quadakers, who is in charge of organizing this MOOC. And what is she doing there? She is holding a spectrometer in front of her eyes, this kind of thing. So what are you doing is you look through it, and if you look through it, you can analyze the light because this thing splits out the light in certain wavelengths. I'll show you here. So if you aim it at a, a, a light source, an artificial light source like this one, you can see the different wavelengths ranging from blue to red that it consists of. So apparently this light bulb produces different wavelengths that combine produce white light. And you can only see it when you split it up with the aid of such a spectroscope. Now, if you aim it at an incandescent lamp, then you get a different spectrum. As you can see, you get all the wavelengths, everything ranging from blue to red. So it's, it's a more fluent uh, spectrum. And if you aim it at the sky, then you get a similar kind of spectrum. So you can see immediately that an incandescent lamp produces light that is more similar to light from the sky that comes from the sun than these modern LEDs. So that's what you can see using such a simple spectroscope. Now, how do astronomers use such a spectroscope? And I'll show you here. They, they use it not only to look at the, the, the spectrum, but they use it to you, uh, look at it in much more detail. And if you do that, then you can observe very specific lines, but you need a real good spectroscope for that. And these lines are indicative of certain chemical elements. They are, in a way, the barcodes of a specific chemical element. So if you see specific lines, then you know, okay, this chemical element must be there. And that's how you uh, astronomers know the chemical composition of the universe, simply by putting a spectroscope or a spectrometer behind a telescope. And that is what astronomers started doing at the beginning of the 20th century. Here you see such an astronomer, Festo Melvin Sliver from the United States. And what he did is look at certain fuzzy objects far away in the sky and having a spectrometer behind his telescope. And this is what he saw. Here you see his original data, photographs of the spectra. Now the lines above and below the big white horizontal line are the standard lines that were put in the lab to, to, as, as calibrations for what you can see, for the observations. But the observation that is the white line and on the left, on the top, you see some of uh, some black lines and that's actually the observation of certain chemical elements, in this case calcium. And what you see is that they're not exactly corresponding to the lines put in uh, in the lab. They move to the right. And then the second uh, example, you see the lines move a little more to the right, and the third and the fourth even further. So what's happening there? Why would they not be in the same place? The only explanation that scientists can think of is that this object is moving away from us. And apparently, the faster it's moving away from us, the more these lines are moved to the right. That's called the redshift of light. So that means that these things are moving away from us very quickly. And the farther away, the faster they seem to move. Now it was a totally unexpected uh, observation. And astronomers didn't know how to interpret that. 
So at a certain point, uh, Sliver reported this at an astronomical conference, I think in 1915 or 1916 or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and uh, that caused big commotion. And there was an astronomer sitting in, uh, in the back in the audience, and it was Edwin Hubble. And after Melvin Sliver decided to stop his observations, he decided to continue that. And he used a real big telescope so he could capture a lot of light. And he started me measuring these distances. How could you do that? And he used uh, variable stars for that. Now, variable stars uh, have a known vari a variation in light output. Uh, so if you find one in a nearby galaxy, then you can estimate the distance that that galaxy is away from us. So he found actually one to his great surprise and delight in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, that's what he's pointing out on this uh, photograph. And that allowed him to make an estimate of the distance of the Andromeda galaxy. So here it is. Here's his original picture. And you see on the upper right, ver, that means variable, with an exclamation mark. So he's very excited about it. Uh, and that allowed him to, to, to uh, guess the distance, and he thought it was roughly 900,000 light years. But of course, it's hard to know exactly how bright such a star is, and better measurements have led to a, a different uh, estimate, and now it's thought to be two and a half uh, b million uh, light years away from us. Well, he did that not only with the Andromeda galaxy, he did it with also with other nearby galaxies. So he started to make a graph, and here you see such a graph, his first graph from 1929, where you see the distance on the x-axis, and you see the, uh, the redshift here is called a recessional uh, velocity, so the speed with which the things move away from us on the y-axis. And you see there is some tendency here, but in the, in the end, if you, all these, these dots seem still fairly scattered uh, around the plot. But there seems to be a tendency, the farther away, the faster they seem to move. And then they started to, to extend this uh, observation. And in the lower left, you see the little rectangle. That was the 20, uh, 1929 observations. And then you see that... If you extend these observations much farther, then the line becomes a lot straighter. So very clearly that at larger scales, galaxies seem to be moving faster away from us the farther they are removed from us. And he did it together with Milton Humason. That's a story by itself. Humason was a, a, a mule driver originally who helped to carry up all the stuff up the mountain uh, near Los Angeles where the telescope was located. That was before the time of of freight trucks. Then he, he became a janitor, keeping, uh, taking care of all the stuff there. And then turned out he was very, very good at handling telescopes, actually perhaps even better than Hubble himself. So you Mason did lots of measurements and he did it very carefully and that made all these discoveries possible. And that is how we know that the universe seems to be expanding and if you project that back in time, there must have been a beginning when everything was basically all together in one single blob of matter and energy, the Big Bang. And that's how we know the history of the universe, by putting a spectrometer behind a telescope, doing careful observations and interpreting that with scholarly uh, ideas. So that's how we know these things in big history, but it's only one example. It's one example of what we know in big history. Everything is based on empirical evidence and scholarly interpretations, and that's it. That's the ultimate criteria for our story.